So we are in Hebrews 6, uh, which last week, the, I mean, the main point of Hebrews 6 is, is about perseverance. It's about calling, in this context, the, the Hebrew believers who are tempted to, to fall away due to the, the push of persecution, the pull of Judaism, the pull of distraction, uh, tempted to drift away from Christ, and the, the main command is to, to hold fast uh, hold fast our confession back in 4.14, and then he gives them, talks about the, the priestly work of Christ in, uh, in Hebrews 4.14 that he's going to talk about and elaborate on really through, I mean, really through chapter 10. And his his point is that Jesus has passed is such a is the great high priest and has passed through the heavens and is in the presence of God and has sat down permanently at the right hand of God, which shows that his work is is totally complete, um, and that that because of that 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 gives us access. Um, so he talks about that, and then he says to the Hebrews he, he warns them about uh, about falling away about just being parallel to the truth or to the knowledge of God, but not actually uh, appropriating that through saving faith. And so he warns them them about that and and encourages them. I'll just start a little bit further back than our passage this morning. We'll be in Hebrews 6.13, but I'll start with Hebrews uh, 6.9, where he says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. In other words, though we're warning you like this, we're convinced that because of the fruit of your lives, that, that you do know the Lord, that you are saved. So, you know, press on uh, and, and show that patience because everything God has promised um, is real, is true. He goes on in verse 10, he says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work, which means the work that God has done in us the saving work of salvation that he'll bring to completion and the love which you have shown toward his name in ministering and in having ministered and still ministering to the saints and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope uh, firm until the end verse 12 it says so that you will not become sluggish or dull but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the question is now, okay, how do we know? that? Are we really sure that we're going to inherit those promises? Is God really going to be faithful? And so God has promised quite a bit in the gospel. What's built into really the, the whole Bible and the gospel that all comes together in Christ that the author of Hebrews has talked about is the author of Hebrews has talked about the nature of, of Christ as the Son, that he's the, he's the Son of God by nature, that he's the exact representation of God, that he uh, shares that, that unique essence of God, and that because of that and in his incarnation and in his work, um, he's the one who's going to accomplish and change world history, and everything's going to orient around him, And he's bringing in a a new era, meaning Jesus is going to reign. uh, Jesus is going to be in charge. He's going to change the world to be oriented around uh, around righteousness. And he's going to rule uh, where where Adam failed to rule over creation, as it talks about in Hebrews 2. Jesus is going to uh, fulfill that. And because we're united with him, we're going to experience that as well. So... That new era is what we're what we're looking forward to, and we but we haven't experienced it yet. We've experienced parts of that. We are in a new era in the sense of the the new covenant and the gospel, but we don't have the fullness uh, of those things yet. Hebrews two talks about you know everything is subjected to Christ as far as God's economy and God's decree, but we don't see everything subjected to Him yet. We don't have also that that rule over creation yet uh, we still have the struggle of the the remaining curse that sin all these things and then if you look around in the world it does not seem like the the world is is subjected to christ and his rule and the rule of righteousness or it, it even at times maybe looks like is this really going to happen are these promises 
uh, are these promises real? And what the author of Hebrews goes on to say, what he said in the last passage, is that yes, these promises are real uh, to such an extent that God has, has staked his, his name and his character on it, that if these promises were not true, that God would be a liar, that God would be unjust. And that's impossible uh, for God because that's, those things are not in his uh, nature, meaning they're not part of what God is, and they're not part of his character, meaning they're not part of who God is in defining truth, in defining justice, in def- being that standard of, of those things. So he talks about those, those promises, and he's going to use uh, this morning in our text the example of God fulfilling the promise uh, to Abraham of giving him uh, a son. And he says basically that if, if God is faithful to this promise, to Abraham, exactly the way that God said it, then you can depend on God to be faithful to all his other promises. In addition, God makes an oath to Abraham. So he has the promise plus the oath. So it's, it's two, uh, two things. It's the, what God says, which would have been good enough, but it's also God's uh, swearing an oath by himself, saying this is, this is doubly sure, and saying and not only did he swear an oath to Abraham, but as chapter 7 is going to elaborate on, he actually swore an oath to Christ, which is what he recites in Psalm 110. And that oath is, you were a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, meaning Jesus brings in a new priesthood, makes the old system obsolete. Jesus accomplishes that. That brings in a new era. Um, and because G- God has sworn an oath to his son, uh, as, as it talks about in Psalm 110, we can be sure uh, that these promises uh, will come, up, come to pass because God is true and because Christ has uh, accomplished these things. But it's kind of interesting here. Uh, what we'll look at this morning and I printed out on some notes, it's something kind of um, along with this, is that um, God makes this oath where he swears by himself. You know, and sometimes well, we do that to a certain extent, but the, when we swear an oath, you usually swear by something higher than yourself to bring, a, bring accountability. Problem is, God can't swear by anyone higher because God is the the ultimate and final authority. So there's nobody above God where God says, okay, this this greater uh, entity needs to hold me accountable to what I've said. There is no greater entity. So is God able to swear by himself? And the answer is yes, but uh, we'll see why why that's the case, why God can be um, self-attesting, why his word is true because he says it, and he's the definition uh, of truth, and why that's not arbitrary. But let's look at uh, Hebrews 6. I'll read uh, the extended passage there, starting in verse 13. It says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, and he quotes Genesis 22, 17, uh, after the almost sacrifice of Isaac, says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, referring to Abraham, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is the end of every dispute. In the same way, Desiring uh, in the same way, God desiring to show to his heirs the promise, uh, the un, uh, the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor to the soul, uh, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. 
having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so a lot there, very, you know, a lot of long uh, sentences where it's like it can be like, okay, what's, what's going on here? But we'll walk through it. And there's some great, uh, great encouragement here, as the author of Hebrews even says. This is an encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us, which is the author of Hebrews is going to repeat that uh, same idea in Hebrews chapter 12, where he talks about the hope set before us. Let us run the race for the hope set before us. And so this is what he's, he's focusing on here. But he does so by focusing on the, the truthfulness, the nature, the character of, of God. Um, and so God uh, swears this oath, as it talks about verse 13, God made the promise to Abraham, and because he can't swear by anyone greater, he swears by himself. So is it, you know, is it valid? Is it legitimate for God to, to swear by himself? That God makes this covenant with Abraham uh, unilaterally. And we could say, okay, well, that's kind of circular for God to be able to swear by himself. But you can kind of think about the fact that uh, who else who else could speak for God? Who else could really <laughs> who, who else could be an alternative to tell us what God is like or what God has said besides uh, besides God Himself? And you can even think about it just at a human level. There comes a certain extent, like if you have to go to the bank or something and prove, you know, sometimes you have to like bring your driver's license or something to prove who you are and kind of appeal to these other things to show, okay, yes, this is who I am, this is where I live, I really am the person who's uh, acting in my name and all that type of stuff, I'm not committing some type of fraud. But at some point, the, the person has to believe that you're who you say you are because, I mean, it's you. Who's the better to speak to you than, uh, than you? Yeah, Jerry? Oh. All swearing, all, is faith. Because if I say, well, by so-and-so, I'm going to do this, you have to have faith that, I mean, right. it all comes down to faith. I have to believe what you're saying, Yeah. period. There is, there right. You need to go any farther. Yeah, and now people could be committing uh, committing perjury. Yeah. But, like you said, and it says here, an oath made by men is, is an end to every dispute. But that doesn't mean just because somebody says, you know, people like the phrase, I swear, I swear to God, I, you know, all this. But, uh, you know, I, I've I known people who have said that they, I swear on my mother, I put my, I, I knew people, I don't know why they said this, they really shouldn't be saying this because it's, it's blasphemous. But they were saying, they would, they would lie up and down, they'd say all these exaggerated things, they'd say, hand to God, man, hand to God truth. I'm like, get your hand off God, what are you talking about? You're lying, you're saying all this, uh, this nonsense, and you're putting your, and, but they, what they didn't realize what they were saying, is when they were so-called putting their hand on God, I'm like, you're asking God to, to hold you accountable and kill you if what you're saying is not true, and it isn't. So, uh, but anyway, people love to say, I swear, I swear. But what the author of Hebrews says here is an oath is an end to every dispute. Meaning, like, if you're in the situation of a court where you've sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then you do lie, and you say, so help me God, uh, which is you're calling down higher authority on yourself. If you lie in the situation of an oath, you, you can do that, but that's perjury. You've committed a crime. And the problem with that is, is you've said, this is my final word, that what I'm saying is true to my own hurt if it is not true. And that's what God has said here, is that if this is not true, if what I've said is not true, what I've promised is not true, then I'm not God. And so that's what he's, he's getting at. It would have been just good enough for God to make a promise, but God makes the promise plus the oath. That's what Hebrews 6, uh, I think it's 18 here, says, that the two unchangeable things, God promised, and then he, he didn't have to, but he super added an oath to say, what I'm saying is true, and I'll swear by myself that if what I'm saying is not true, then I'm not God. And so God has, has staked his, his own uh, name and character on this. Um, that being said, this brings up kind of an interesting uh, 
uh, and kind of a funny uh, philosophical issue that I've, that I've put there in your notes, and it's called, I've talked about this before, but it's actually a pretty profound problem. Um, and it's called, it's sometimes called other things and people throughout philosophical history have noticed this, but this is called the Munchausen Trilemma, where it's named after this guy who had all these kind of like funny German folk tales and stories. He used to have stories where he would like, there would be a cannonball shot out and he's like, yeah, I rode on top of the cannonball over to this place or whatever. So anyway, funny things like that. But there's this story and there's a, a picture there I've included uh, in your notes. Um, of this, but, but the kind of question is, you know, a lot of people are, are kind of unaware of how tenuous any claims to knowledge and truth actually are. Because if you keep asking why, you know, what are you presupposing, what are you assuming, you cut down to follow the two-year-old path where you just keep saying why, why, it usually comes back to, yeah, and then you hit the person or, say, or it comes back to because I said so, or be, it, if you really keep working any claims back why far enough, um, they basically come to like one of three or four options and none of them are sufficient for um, being a justification of knowledge, which means all claims to knowledge are impossible. Except if you start with the biblical worldview and biblical theism. It, it, unless you presuppose that, all knowledge is, is arbitrary, inconsistent, or both, and, and impossible. And so, uh, so anyway, but the, the Munchausen trilemma is named after this guy, uh, Munchausen. Um, and it, it, the story is that he's riding through this swamp on his horse, and he gets stuck in this, this mire, this swamp. And so he can't get out his horse, he can't get it to like maneuver any particular direction. So he's like, okay, how do I get out of this? So he could get off the horse, but he wants the horse to come with him. Uh, so he, he's, he's trying to, he's stuck. So he comes up with this clever solution where he grabs his own hair, his ponytail, and he, he t tightens his legs on his horse and he pulls himself out by his own hair, uh, himself and his horse. But you see that the problem with that is that he can't do that. He can't, you can't pull yourself up. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. And uh, so while this is a uh, German folk tale, it, it has a pretty profound, uh, why it's uh, nicknamed this problem, the Munchausen trilemma is nicknamed this, uh, is because it represents these, uh, these three unsatisfactory options for any claim to knowledge. Um, and so there's a chart, a couple charts on the next page, but if you keep asking any claim, this is if you ask about a scientific claim. Okay, well, we, you did this experiment. Okay, well, what did you use? Well, we used the scientific method. Okay, what did the scientific method assume? It assumed these things. Okay, well, what did those things assume? And you just keep going back. And scientific method is, is good, and logic is good, and all that stuff is good too. That being said, you keep working back, you'll end up in one of three answers, and, and all of these are logical errors that don't allow you to have knowledge. Uh, the first one is, is there on the left, that if you keep going back, you end up in infinite regression or infinite regress, which means there's always, eternally, another answer under that. The problem with that is that we're finite beings with finite knowledge. And if there's always an infinite number of answers, then you couldn't have knowledge in an infinite number of answers, be meaning we're, we're stuck. You can't, you can't really know anything to be true in that sense because knowledge is, is infinity, vastly unknowable. You couldn't, any, anything you think you know could be contradicted by something else that, that you don't know. And so it could go on forever. And so finite creatures can't have uh, finite knowledge if, if this is true. So another one is that it ends, in, uh, it ends in circular grounding or circular reasoning, arbitrary circular reasoning, which means, okay, A is true because of B. Well, why is B true? Well, because of A. And, you just, and it's arbitrary. You just keep, it may be valid, uh, it may not be a, involve a logical contradiction, but the belief is not justified. 
Okay, so that that's a logical problem as well, which means that everything that that we believe in that sense would be arbitrary. Any other claim to knowledge would be uh, would be unjustified. Um, and then the last one is is called axiomatic grounding, and it's just you get down to the bottom, and there's just this kind of fundamental truth that you can't prove. It just is. It you know you can't prove why you can't explain it. There's just this at the bottom. There's this truth. You could call it you know a or whatever, but it's unjustified. You can't prove it. You can't explain it. It just ends. And it's just a brute fact. The problem with that is, if you try to, if you say, the basis of all our knowledge is built on top of this one brute fact that we can't explain, that means everything built on top of it is subject to question. It's arbitrary. You can't really know it to be true. If, if the thing at the bottom, you're not sure, and you can't explain what it is, it just is, then you try to put like the scientific method on top of that, that may mean the scientific method is, is arbitrary. Now, we can have knowledge, and we do, but this is a, this is a pretty serious problem. Right? This is a, a problem that people aren't aware of. So some people try to say, like skeptics uh, throughout history have, who have identified this, they try to say, okay, well, there's no such thing as knowledge. You can't know anything to be true. Problem with that is there is such a thing as knowledge. We, we know that to be the case. Uh, we otherwise there's there's no you know, there's no possibility of of interaction of language of this this type of discussion. So and, and if you claim that there is no knowledge, that's self defeating because you're saying I know that there's no knowledge, and so that that just adds uh, doesn't solve the problem. It just adds to it. So okay, well what is, what solves this issue. You know, everybody claims to know things, to swear things, to uh, find answers to things, to be able to use logic, empiricism, reason, scientific method, which are all uh, good things insofar as they go as tools. But what makes those things justified? And the only thing that would make those things justified is the knowledge of, of God, who's the creator, Who's, who's created and sustains the world, who, who does know everything, who is the ultimate authority, who is the standard of truth, and because he is the standard of truth and the one who creates and rules all things, God can swear by himself and not be arbitrary. God can be the final authority where, yes, there is a, a spiral. It is, in that sense, somewhat circular, but it's not... Uh, it's not viciously circular. It's a, it's a virtuous circle where, uh, where God is not just saying, because I said so. All truth is based in God's nature and character. So we've included there, you know, Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So when we talk about that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, I hope we're understanding and meaning by that, that we're saying without knowing God and being consistent, the unbeliever or anyone else cannot know anything. Now, we're not saying, well, I know unbelievers who are scientists, doctors, etc. Well, that's because by using their knowledge, they're showing that they do, in fact, know God. But Romans 1 says that because of our rebellion against God, that we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. So every, every act in the world, every usage of knowledge is, uh, is evidence that people know God, and not just know a God, not just know an unmoved mover or the first causer, but know the God of the Bible, the God of, uh, of Scripture. Now, they don't know him savingly, unless the gospel uh, is, is brought to them. But we all know God, and that's why Romans 1 talks about uh, that we're without excuse. So this is why God can swear by himself without being arbitrary, because he's, he's all-knowing. He's the source of knowledge, and he's the one who defines knowledge, defines truth, defines justice as the ultimate uh, authority, as the ultimate reference point. Otherwise, there is no standard for those things.
So only God is able, in this sense, to, to swear by himself. But because God does swear by himself, uh, we can know it's true. This is also how we can know uh, that scripture is true, is because uh, where has this God revealed himself? Well, he's revealed himself in, in scripture. He's revealed himself in lots of ways, but uh, the special revelation of God is, is in his word. Um, and so God tells us about himself. And so this is why God is, is able to, uh, to do what we cannot do. God is able to unilaterally swear, uh, swear by himself uh, and we have to swear by one greater, right? We swear by, uh, ultimately, by God. We're asking God to bring accountability on us. And so what the author of Hebrews is doing is bringing that, that truth to bear of God's truthfulness uh, in the promise that God made to Abraham as an example. Because the promise that God made to Abraham, there are several other promises built into that. Remember that Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, etc., different places, God promises to Abraham you know, three main things, the land, seed, uh, and blessing, and that in Abraham all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that's relevant for us as well because uh, that means that it's, it's through Abraham that the, the nations uh, the families of the earth, the Gentiles, would receive that, uh, that blessing as well. Um, and also, that's through the seed promised to Abraham. Not only would he be a great nation, but the seed uh, singular that would come from Abraham uh, would be Christ, who saves Jews and Gentiles. So, uh, the author of Hebrews here points to, he goes on in verse 13, he says, for when God made the promise, now this promise here is singular, to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, and then let's go back to uh, Genesis 22, 17. This is where God made this promise. And you'll see here that the author of Hebrews does not quote the whole uh the whole scripture. He's, he's using a particular part of it uh, to demonstrate his point. Now, he's, he's doing so correctly and in context, but he's, he's using partial of it because the truth is um, Abraham, and the author of Hebrews will go on to say uh, later on uh, about Abraham and others, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. So Abraham didn't receive the full promise of the land. He didn't receive the full promise of uh, the nation becoming the father of many nations in his, his lifetime. He didn't receive the promise of, the, uh, of all the nations being blessed in him in his lifetime. But the one promise that he did uh, receive, which is why it's singular in Hebrews, the one promise that he did uh, receive was the promise that God would give him a son through him and Sarah, and that through this son, that he would be the rest of these promises would be fulfilled. And so, look at uh, Genesis twenty-two uh, seventeen. Well, actually, we'll start in verse uh, sixteen because I think here is where the, he starts referring to. Now, remember the context of Genesis twenty-two is the sacrifice of of Isaac. Okay. But I'll read this and I will talk about that a little bit more. So this is where the, the angel of the Lord is speaking, who, who speaks and acts as God himself. He says here in verse 16, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven's uh, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you obeyed my voice. So that, I quoted 16 through 18, but the author of Hebrews just says, promise, singular, 
and then just quotes that, uh, you know, I will give you descendants, I will give you a seed. He just quotes that, that one aspect of it. Um, now, remember, keep in mind here, the author of Hebrews is using Abraham as an example of, of faith and patience. So, faith is the kind of founding principle of Israel in Abraham, Genesis 15, right, that Abraham believed God and God credited that to him as righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. But God has been, he called Abraham back in Genesis 12. He made the promises of the land, the seed, and the blessing uh, several times. And he says, I'm going to give you a son. But Abraham, through Genesis 12, really all the way through Genesis 21, tries to kind of go around um, or reinterpret God's promise. So he believed what God said, but he said, okay, well, maybe it'll come in a, in a different way. So in Genesis 15, he says, okay, well, maybe... Uh, Maybe God's not literally going to give me a son that's going to be birthed from my own body since I'm old. He was about 75 when God called him. He's about 100 when he gives birth to, uh, to Isaac. Um, so he says, okay, in Genesis 15, he's, he's saying to God, well, maybe my servant Eliezer, he'll be my heir. And maybe that will be how God will fulfill the promises. And God says, no, I'm going to cause you to have a son. And, uh, and so Abraham believes. But then Abraham and Sarah are kind of thinking through this and are like, okay, well, we've confirmed you, but Genesis 16, Sarah says, okay, but maybe, maybe I don't have to be involved. Uh, how about you have a son with my maidservant Hagar, and that will be you having a son. He'll technically be, you know, kind of an heir, and we can, you know, work it out that way. So they do that. Abraham listens to, to Sarah, which is an echo of uh, Adam saying that he listened to the voice of his, his wife when he, she took the fruit and he listened, um, which isn't bad in, in general, but it's bad uh, when referring to sin. Um, but so they try to get around the promise that way. And again, God says, no, I'm telling you. And he sends... He sends uh, likely God himself comes in human form with angels in Genesis 18 and says, no, I'm telling you, at about this time next year, you and Sarah will have a son. And then in, Gen so then that, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah takes place, Genesis 19, Genesis 20. There's a couple times in there, in the, over a span of years, where Abraham uh, thinks he's going to get killed, so he says, Sarah's my sister, which was kind of true, uh, but not, not the full truth. And so these kings think she's beautiful and take her as a wife, and Abraham's like, he gets in trouble with God, obviously, because of that. Then in Genesis 21, finally Isaac is, is born, and the promise is fulfilled. And in Genesis 22, God says... Uh, Genesis, 12, I'll read verses 1 and 2. He says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you. Now, not only is this painful, and this seems to be, God's not okay with, with murder. God's not okay with human sacrifice in this sense. God's not okay with... Uh, and, and this would be an undoing of, of God's promise, that after all this, they finally have a son, God's going to fulfill the promises in him. But he tells him to kill him. Take him and offer him, him as, a burnt, uh, as a burnt offering. And Abraham... Faith is growing to maturity. He has saving faith, at least back in Genesis uh, 15. But his faith continues to mature to this, this point of 
maturity where he he's now tested by God and says, okay, and, and his, his faith, you can even see in Genesis uh, 22, which verse is it, talks about, okay, Genesis 22, 5, where he, Abraham leaves and Isaac leave the servants behind. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. So Abraham has an idea of what's going on. Hebrews 11 even suggests that Abraham uh, figured, okay, well, God has said what he said and I believe him and God, I if he's able to create the world and, and cause me and Sarah to have a son, then he can, he can raise the dead as well. Uh, and so Abraham is, is ready to sacrifice. The angel of the Lord stops him from doing that. And God says, okay, you know, he, he showed Abraham that he tested him um, and said, I, now I know you, you did not withhold uh, your son from me. So now the promise is totally um, actualized, totally fulfilled. Um, and Abraham's uh, faith is, is brought to maturity in that sense. So the author of Hebrews here says, if we could turn back there. Author of Hebrews says uh, that God swore by himself, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. So he quotes that showing, okay, this was God's, God's proof that God uh, had made this oath. And then it describes Abraham. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And so he's using Abraham to the Hebrews, which is, you know, I mean, they're, they're founding father. And he's saying, look, remember Abraham believed God, and he had to wait for like 40 years he had, to, he, he had faith, but he had to persevere in that faith and be patient in that faith and wait for that one promise, that one aspect of God's promises to be fulfilled. And so that's what the author of Hebrews is encouraging the audience here with, is that remembering those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. And that promises is plural, that we're waiting as well, that we, you, we may be waiting our whole lives, but the author of Hebrews is saying, look, when this comes to an end, we, we're waiting, and what God has said and promised is true, and we will experience that new era, but what's required right now is, is faith and patience, waiting for a process that's taking longer than we want it to take. And so he uses Abraham as that example and goes on in verse 16 says, For men swear by one greater than themselves. So that's like when you're in a court, you swear. I swear on my mother's grave. Um, I was watching uh, one of, uh, I guess it's one of my favorite movies, Count of uh, Monte Cristo, where, he, where the, the main character has this knife fight where, with this guy where he decides not to, not to kill him. And... Um, and basically afterward, the guy, you know, pulls him real close and says, listen, I swear on all my dead relatives, even the ones who aren't feeling too good, I'm your man forever. <laughs> and so uh, he's kind of the comic relief in, the, in that movie. But, um, but the, the swearing, and I remember being a kid and asking my dad, I'm like, why did he say that? And he, he goes, well, you're, you're swearing by something that's really important uh, to say that you're really serious about this. So... Um, but, but that's what swearing an oath means. It, they, we swear by something higher than ourselves, so that's why you put your hand on the Bible or something like that. Um, but God, God's the final authority. He, he doesn't have to swear. He can just say it, and it's true. But God does here swear an oath. He says in the same way, uh, verse 17, in the same way God, desiring even more to show to his uh, to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. Meaning, whatever God says is true. It's Titus 1-2, it's impossible for God to lie. God has a, a totally self-consistent uh, 
nature. He's, he's the God of truth. He's, he's the unlying God in his character. And that's not because God is, is lacking some power. That means that's, that's who God is, and that's what God delights in. And so God can just say something and it be true. But the author of Hebrews is saying God not only makes the promise, which would have been good enough, but he also adds, in, in the case of Abraham and in the case of Christ, he adds an oath. That God says, I, by the way, I'm going to highlight the truthfulness and the unchangeableness of this promise by swearing by myself that this is true. And that if this were not true, I would not be God. And so God has staked his, his whole uh, name, character, and reputation on these things being true. And so th- these things are not uh, negotiable. They're, they're not debatable. It's like when people, sometimes they try to uh, defend Christianity, but I think in, instead they uh, are, are working against that and what they're saying in this. But a lot of times people will say, well, you know what? Even if what God has not promised and what I believe is not true, at least I lived my life with hope, unlike you atheists or whatever, you unbelievers. But that's not... The, the type of language or argumentation that the Bible uses. It, sa- it says that, no, this is true to the extent that if it is not, God is a liar. And because God is not a liar, you can be guaranteed these things are true. Now, he uses the example of Abraham uh, to show that in, in one case, that if God fulfilled this one promise to Abraham exactly as he said it, then he will fulfill the rest of these promises exactly as he said it as well. And he goes on and says, verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things, that is the the promise plus the oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hope of the, uh, to take hold of the hope that is set before us. That take hold of, the hope is the same idea back in Hebrews 4 of of hold fast your confession, uh, which Hebrews 10.23 will say as well. Now let us hold fast our confession that God has has so said and backed up what he has said with this oath to, to show that this is true for the future in Christ to give us such a strong confidence and hope that we better take hold of this. This is encouragement to say, yes, we can, it can be guaranteed that what God has said is absolutely true. And so we know this because it's God's, uh, God's character, God's faithfulness. Um, And he says, take hold of the hope uh, set before us. And again, Hebrews 12 for the hope that is set before us, run with endurance, the race that is set before us. That's, that's the same idea that's, that's being brought up uh, again. Let me just read some, some uh, passages related to this, because it's, it's not just that God is true in content or informationally. It's because God is true, that's the basis not only for, for knowledge of anything, but that's the basis for the knowledge of when God promised in the gospel our salvation and all the things that accompany that, that God is going to accomplish in Christ with this world. Uh, that means our hope as well. So listen to Hebrew, uh, to 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20. Paul is, is writing to the Corinthians, defending his apostleship, but he says, but as God is faithful... Our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, was preached to you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore, through him he is our amen, agreement or yes, uh, to the glory of God through us. Now, it's, okay, what's Paul getting at here? He says, but as God is faithful, based on the faithfulness of God, our word to you is not yes and no. 
Meaning we didn't preach a, a gospel saying, God, yes, God has promised all these things, but really it's not true. But really he means no. Not that, okay, God has, has said this, yes, and meant no. That God has, has made these promises in Christ, and yes, they are true. Uh, based on God's faithfulness, based on God's character. And he says Christ, by sending Christ, is our amen to the glory of God, which means Jesus is our, our truth, our agreement, of our, our seal of those promises to the glory of God. Um, and so if God is, says something is true based on his character, that's the end of the dispute. Uh, again, Titus 1, 1 through 3, Paul starts off that letter, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life. So that's the promise. The hope is eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So it's because God cannot lie, that's the hope of eternal life. And verse 3, but at the proper time was manifested even by his word and the proclamation uh, with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. So it's not just that it saves truth, the fact that God cannot lie and that he's the standard of truth, which it does, but it also gives, gives uh, authority to the, the promise of eternal life that God has promised. So if God could lie, if this is not true, uh, then, then we're doomed. There's no other, uh, no other option. And so the author of Hebrews now pivots a little bit and continues his, his thought. Verse 19, he says, This hope is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, which enters within the veil. And so this hope, he, he elaborates on uh, even more. He, he describes it as an anchor. You know what that is? And there's, there's some uh, variation to this term. But an anchor is something that, that holds something in place, namely like holds a boat in place, right? That it goes back to chapter 2 where he warns against drifting away from Christ, against, you know, being in the harbor, floating around in the water, but not having been connected to Christ through saving faith, not having been tethered to him, and drifting away, being, being parallel, as, the, as uh, Hebrews 6 talks about. And so he says, but this hope, based on, in Christ, based on the promise of God, that comes with the oath of God, is an anchor to the soul, meaning it, it locks down, it, it holds in place, and he talks about this hope even more, he says that it's sure and that it's steadfast. Uh, the idea of the word sure, so we sing in church sometimes, the, or you guys may have heard the song Christ, the sure and steady anchor. Uh, you can kind of have a, a fuller understanding of that, this idea of where this is taken from. The idea of sure means that, that the statements or the promises that have been made that you have full information and you're not missing something that would cause you to uh, rethink the deal. Okay, so you're not missing critical information that would make it other than what you thought. So for example, you can promise, something could be promised to you, but like if you took a contract and something is promised to you in a contract, and then in the fine print, it says something that basically changes the whole nature of the deal, to where you would not have agreed with it because you didn't have full information. That's, uh, that's the opposite of what it's saying here. He's saying it's sure, God has not withheld critical knowledge or content about his promise that he's going to reveal at a later time that's going to make his promise not true or that's going to reinterpret his promise or that's going to make some type of, uh, make some type of adjustment. He will fulfill his promises exactly as he made them. That being said, we have to wait for that. We have to wait for those promises to, uh, to be fulfilled. 
uh, and that takes patience, that takes perseverance, that takes continued faith over uh, a long period of time. And so he, the author of Hebrews encourages us that this is sure, but he also encourages us that this is steadfast, that this hope is steadfast, meaning not only is it internally consistent and you're not missing critical information, but there, there's nothing outside of it that could come into the, the situation, change the circumstances, and adjust the promises that way. So, for example, this would be like you make a contract with someone under a certain agreement and you have full information and what you both agreed on, but your circumstances change. So, like, if you're, you promise to pay, you know, on, uh, like, a loan, car loan or something like that, you're obligated to do that. But let's say you lose your job or something like that. Okay, well, now your circumstances have changed. You're still obligated, but, uh, but your circumstance has changed. Um, so, or there may be a, a, a change where the person making a promise makes a promise under certain conditions, but now the conditions are, are different. They say, well, now, I mean, things are different. I mean, there are externals that, have, that I'm not in control of that have now... Uh, cause the deal to be invalid. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is that God, not only has he not withheld critical information, but there's nothing that can come into this hope or this promise that will change it from the outside. No circumstances, no, no adjustment of situation can change what God has said and what God has, uh, what God has promised. And so he says... And this is because uh, this is our hope which enters within the veil, verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So how do we know these promises are true? Well, it's because of the, the high priestly work of Christ. So what is, what's it talking about entering in the veil? Well, that's the, the language of entering into the veil that the high priest did, entering into the veil of uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple on once a year on the Day of Atonement described in Leviticus 16. And he had to make a sacrifice for himself. He had to put the blood of the altar on the, uh, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, make an atonement for sin. And that resets the, the whole system. And it's for the sins, uh, sins of the people. But as far as we know, Jesus of Nazareth, he's not of the priestly line of Levi, he never walked into the, the Holy of Holies in the temple when he was on, on earth. But what the author of Hebrews will elaborate on is he'll say, no, no, no. What you don't understand is the temple is a copy. It's, it's an example of God's temple in heaven, and it's a sample of how God's temple is going to be uh, eventually basically f filling out the whole earth from God's epicenter. And so the temple represents those things. But Christ made his sacrifice for sin by the offering of himself on the cross and then ascended into heaven. But here's, here's the key differences. So Christ goes through the veil into the true holy of holies in heaven, but the, the high priests, they go in there and all things being well, they come back out. They, they have, they're not allowed to just go in there, and there's no chair in there. The only uh, chair, so to speak, is the mercy seat, which is supposed to be the footstool or the throne of, of God where you make atonement. But the, there's, the priest stands in there, leaves, and then completes the sacrifice uh, once a year. The author of Hebrews says, no, Jesus goes through the, the true veil into heaven, and he never left. He's still there, and not only did he stay there, showing that his sacrifice is complete, he sits down at the right hand of God, quoting Psalm uh, 110, meaning that because we know Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of God, that's, even though we don't see everything subjected to Christ and we don't see the fullness of those promises yet, that's our guarantee and our encouragement and our hope that 
all these things will be fulfilled. And what's even uh, greater here is it says where Jesus entered as a forerunner and never left, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, meaning Jesus became a priest by God's declaration, also Psalm 110, and another oath that God makes not to Abraham this time, but to Jesus. You are a priest forever. Not according to Levi, but according to the order of Melchizedek. You're the king priest that God is going to accomplish everything for, through. And so what the author of Hebrews uh, gets at here is that, so remember, on, the high priest was only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. The author of Hebrews will elaborate on this and say, because we're united to Christ, uh, we can go into the Holy of Holies and that that's what we, where we will be with Christ. And not only will we not die, but we're welcomed there uh, because of the sacrifice of Christ. Not only are we not high priests, not Jews, but we're, we're Gentiles. But because we're united with Christ, uh, his high priestly work is accomplished, we're welcome there. And so whenever we pray, whenever we worship, uh, we, are, we have that access uh, to God, that unique access that's a sample of, uh, of what Christ has accomplished. Um, but anyway, so let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer and then and enjoy that access, even in our prayer uh, before God's, uh, God's throne of grace, and then we'll go to worship. Lord God, we thank you for the hope in Christ uh, based on your nature and character, your truthfulness, that it is impossible for you to lie. And Lord, we thank you for the promise of that in Christ, who because he is at your right hand, that we can approach your throne as the throne of grace, uh, that we know that the completed work of Christ gives us access to you, Lord, that we, uh, to our shame, that we underappreciate, that we, we underestimate uh, the value of, of what we have in Christ. So, Lord, we thank you that we can, uh, because of our being united to him, enter within the veil and have that, uh, that fellowship with you that will uh, one day be fully accomplished because uh, what you have promised is true and because you are faithful. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.